I'm Master Chief Mark Hakala. I spent 30 years in the Navy, but I've spent my whole life being intrigued by naval customs, traditions, history, heritage, and uniforms. So I'd like to share some of that enthusiasm with you using some items in my personal collection to get us started. Let's see what's in the sea chest today. The Cutlass. For centuries it's been the sailor's weapon of choice for boarding enemy ships or defending one's own. There have been different patterns with different blade shapes and lengths. And based on the diversity of these radically different designs you see throughout Navy history, straight blade, curved blade, long blade, short blade, brass hilt, iron hilt, it's hard to say exactly what kind of sword a cutlass is. The easiest thing to say is that it was not a personal weapon. Cutlasses were normally stored in racks on bulkheads in strategic areas of the ship ready for quick access if under attack. The earliest pattern of U.S. Navy Cutlass is the Model 1797. There had been some in use during the Revolutionary War by the Continental Navy, but each ship pretty much had to get whatever it could get its hands on. The design of the Model 1797 is, is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. It's a straight blade, 29 inches long. The hilt is described as either a double disc or a figure eight guard because the hilt started off as one sheet of metal with two discs on it and then it was curved around to make the handguard. This style was very similar to British cutlasses of the era both before and after. The main difference is that the quality in the American ones is probably not as good. Although this is referred to as a model 1797, this design actually goes back many many decades. If you go to Massachusetts to the Concord Museum, you'll see a sword exactly like this. And it's said that it was carried by Colonel James Barrett, who led the American militia during the battles of Lexington and Concord in April of 1775. A few years later in 1808, Nathan Starr, a manufacturer who had made 1797 pattern cutlasses, was approached by the Navy to produce new cutlasses for their ships. Nathan Starr would produce several different patterns of cutlasses throughout the years, each with a little bit of a difference in the design. Similar in blade length to the 1797, the model 1808 had a 28 and a half inch single edge straight blade. The guard was made of iron and it was beaten into a concave shape on the inside to wrap around the hand and then it was lacquered black. Both the Model 1797 and the Model 1808 would be the workhorses of the War of 1812. A few years later, the Navy placed another order for cutlasses with Nathan Starr. The Model 1816 would be virtually identical to the 1808 model, except the 1816 had a slightly shorter blade at 25 and 3 quarters inches. A decade later, in 1826, Nathan Starr got another contract from the Navy. The Model 1826 had a major design change. Although the length remained virtually the same as its predecessor, and the hilt was very similar to the last two, this style was massively different because the shape of the blade was now curved, and it was a pretty pronounced curvature. The next cutlass would come along in 1841. By the time we get to the 1840s, the Navy needs new cutlasses and they find a new maker, the Ames Manufacturing Company of Chicopee, Massachusetts. Over the years, Ames would prove itself quite capable in working government contracts and being able to take products they made for one service and adapt them to another. In 1832, Ames produced a foot artillery short sword for the army. This sword was patterned after the Roman gladius, you know, the kind gladiators would use. 
So when Ames got the contract for the Navy cutlasses, what did they do? They took the foot artillery short sword, changed the hilt, making it a D handguard, and voila, the foot artillery short sword is now a cutlass. Design-wise, this isn't like any previous cutlass. This is a shorter blade at 21 inches long. It's got a double edge on it, and the whole hilt and handguard are made of brass. The end result is you have something that's heavy, kind of unwieldy, and wasn't very popular, although this did become the predominant pattern used by the Confederate Navy during the Civil War. Now let's take a second to discuss training. If all these sailors were expected to know how to use a cutlass, they had to learn somehow. And as you can imagine, it'd get pretty dangerous learning how to use a sword by hacking and slashing with actual cutlasses. So there was a training version of the cutlass that was called a single stick. This would have a wooden blade and a leather handguard. Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick, discusses single sticks in his book recounting his time in the U.S. Navy in 1843. He writes, Single stick, as everyone knows, is a delightful pastime, which consists in two men standing a few feet apart and wrapping each other over the head with long poles. There is a good deal of fun in it, so long as you're not hit. But a hit in the judgment of discreet persons, spoils the sport completely. When this pastime is practiced by connoisseurs ashore, they wear heavy wired helmets to break the force of the blows. But the only helmets of our tars were those with which nature had furnished them. In 1801, the French Navy designed a cutlass that became very popular. It had a blade with a slight curve and a solid handguard that had good coverage around the hand. The French referred to this particular style of handguard as cuillère à peau, which means soup ladle. In 1833, they made a very minor decorative change to the design, and navies of different countries throughout Europe adopted this pattern. And so did we. The Model 1861 Cutlass. Now, a lot of people refer to this as the Model 1860, but it's not quite right. Once again, our friends at Ames Manufacturing borrowed the key component of the brass hilt that they had used in the Model 1860 Cavalry Saber and applied it to the new Cutlass. Although the hilt was borrowed from the Army's 1860 sword, the contract for the Navy Cutlass didn't come through until 1861. To copy the cuillère à peau handguard from the French Cutlass, they did one major thing different. The French one, the handguard was made of iron or steel. The U.S. one, it was made of brass. And it wasn't particularly thick brass either. So just about all of the Model 1861 cutlasses that you see today, they're going to have lots of dings and dents in the handguard. The 1861's steel blade had a curve very similar to the French model. And at the base of the handle, or the pommel, they used a Phrygian cap style, which was basically the same thing they had used on the 1860 cavalry saber. The Model 1861 was made in the tens of thousands and was used during the Civil War in battles such as the assault on Fort Fisher, North Carolina in 1864-65. This model would remain around well into the 20th century. And it was chosen as a key component of the design of the enlisted surface warfare insignia. One mistake you'll see is that there's an imaginary left-handed version of the cutlass on the Iswas pen. The Navy continued to give instruction in the use of the cutlass into the 20th century. The drill manuals of both 1898 and 1899 each had chapters on offensive and defensive techniques with the cutlass. The cutlass is even mentioned as a potential weapon for a landing party member in the landing party manual of 1938.
for its next pattern of cutlass, the Navy would model their sword on an 1898 Dutch military sword called the Mare Chazé, or Cloang. The model 1917 U.S. Navy cutlass had a new and bolder look with a blued steel blade of 24 and 7 eighths inches and a blackened handguard. In dimensions, it was almost identical to the Cloang. The major difference is the 1917 Cutlass had a solid handguard, where the Cloang had cutouts. The last Cutlass to be purchased by the U.S. Navy for use as an actual weapon was the Model 1941. A lot of people have called this the 1917 variant, but in reality, it is the Cloang. Same dimensions, same cutouts. Small numbers of these were actually known to be used by Navy and Army personnel during World War II. In the years after World War II, the Navy began to take stock in things. We were now in an age of air power, helicopters, jets, and nuclear weapons. The days of coming alongside an enemy ship and boarding with cutlass in one hand and pistol in the other had come and gone. In November 1949, the cutlass was officially declared obsolete as a weapon by the Navy Bureau of Ordnance. The venerable Navy cutlass had slipped into history. Or had it? Drawing on its history and symbolism, the cutlass had been used over many decades as a symbol of leadership for the leading recruit in boot camp companies. For this purpose, a version known as the Great Lakes Pattern Cutlass emerged. The Great Lakes Pattern was different. All the metal was shining stainless steel, but it did share some vague similarities in design to the Model 1917. This was the first cutlass I ever saw. In fact, I had the privilege of carrying it. This is a picture of me carrying the Great Lakes Pattern Cutlass as the recruit chief petty officer of the drill team during my boot camp graduation at Recruit Training Command in Great Lakes in 1981. If you can see, my copy of the Great Lakes Cutlass is an authentic one that was used by recruits as evidenced by all the dings and gouges in the sharp edge of the blade from recruits playing swatch buckler when nobody was looking. For years, the Great Lakes pattern was the only cutlass that anyone saw. Eventually, companies would make cutlasses loosely based on the Model 1861, designed as retirement mementos. In the early 2000s, the U.S. Navy Ceremonial Guard adopted a cutlass as the sword for its chief petty officers. For the various kinds of ceremonies and funerals that the Navy Ceremonial Guard performs, chiefs needed to have a sword. Non-commissioned officers in other branches of the armed forces had a dedicated sword to themselves. And for a few years, the chiefs in the Navy Ceremonial Guard actually carried Navy officer swords. But a manufacturer was found who could make essentially the Model 1861 Cutlass, but with a blade of varying length. Because of the unique drill movements of the Five Services Honor Guard in the Washington, D.C. area, the blade had to be graduated based on the carrier's height. So when at the ceremonial at-ease position, the tip of the sword could touch the deck. If they'd strictly followed the pattern of the Model 1861 Cutlass, everyone would have had a 26-inch blade. Not too many people would be able to reach the deck with a 26-inch blade. So a desire began to build 
tr- create a ceremonial cutlass for chief petty officers. And I was fortunate enough that I was able to assist that process. The Command Master Chief of the Navy Ceremonial Guard and I had a chance encounter with Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Rick West, just a few months after he took office. We proposed the idea that there should be a Chief Petty Officer's Cutlass and explained that it would be fairly easy to do because there was already a model of the Cutlass in production that the Ceremonial Guard was using. After hearing us out, Mick Pond smiled. He said, I love it. Put everything together, send it to my office, and we'll push this thing through. Over the next several weeks, there was work to be done. There was research on all the different patterns and designs of cutlasses throughout Navy history. In fact, most of what you're seeing in this presentation came out of that research. And recommended that we go with a version of the Model 1861. It was the most iconic, definitely the best looking one that we'd ever had. And it appeared on many sailors' chests in the form of the enlisted surface warfare pin. So a lot of compiled research and a very detailed proposal went over to Mick Pond's office. While the proposal was there, the design took a few changes. First, the Phrygian cap style pummel at the base of the handle was changed to a more flattened one that bore an image of the first Chief Petty Officer anchor that was introduced in 1897. Another inclusion was on the Ricasso at the base of the blade near the hilt. The four anchors for Chief, Senior Chief, Master Chief, and Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy would be engraved. Additionally, the Cuillère à Peau handguard was enlarged in size, though I'm not quite sure why. A few months later, at an event for the Navy's Sailors of the Year, Mick Pond West spotted me and moved quickly in my direction with a big smile on his face. And he said, we just got the prototype of the Cutlass back and CNO loves it. So ultimately on March 31st, 2010, NAVADMIN 11810 authorized the CPO ceremonial Cutlass officially. Just a few months after that, I was fortunate enough to become one of the first people ever to wear it in a ceremony. In fact, I wore it in two. On a Friday, I wore it at my father's funeral at Arlington National Cemetery. And on Saturday, I wore it at my retirement. Check back soon for more content. Thanks for watching.